Okay, so um, my name's Amy Beeston and I'm going to present uh, a talk today which was written with Cleo Pike as well on applications of perceptual psychology and neuroscience to audio engineering problems. And I'm afraid Cleo can't be with us today for unforeseen circumstances, but I'm going to do my best to present both parts of the work. Uh, and fingers crossed for me, please. We'll see how this goes. Um, hopefully I'll do a reasonable job, but um, Cleo has said that she's happy to take any questions as well. So I've got her contact details for you towards the end of the talk. Um, so the kind of intersection between human and listening, human and machine listening, is really where Cleo and I have come together in our work. We've had um, a similar kind of research background in some ways, similar PhD topic, but quite different starts to our um, studies and our path through uh, the university. Um, but as many of you are probably working in this field and are aware, there's a lot of intersection between the disciplines already. And I think there are many different career paths you can take through these topics. Um, Cleo worked in music production to begin with, and then um, worked on kind of experimental methods in psychology, and followed up with a psychoacoustics-based PhD, leading her towards research in multisensory perception up in St Andrews at the moment. Um, my own background is kind of uh, classical music beginnings. Um, my dad was in a string quartet and I was a chorister as a child, so very kind of um, separate lives actually between my musical life and when I first left school I studied physics. But within a year I was kind of bringing these together and studying music technology for undergraduate instead. Um, I then did a master's in sonology, kind of studying about sound more thoroughly and began really focusing on sound analysis there. And um, it also kind of led my uh, research direction towards understanding room acoustics and how we could adapt to different environments. So my own research was driven by this kind of creative problem of hanging a microphone in a space and wanting to understand the signal at the microphone, um, which I could intuitively interpret with my ears, but not necessarily get the same results from the signal processing side on the microphone. So my PhD was um, spent uh, running human experiments and making a computer model that tried to simulate these effects. Um, but doing this in the world of speech and hearing research rather than in music itself. Um, and that's led me through my work in Sheffield in the speech and hearing group to do quite a few projects to do with um, speech assessment and specifically listening to speech either with a healthy functioning auditory system or with um, various degrees of impairment as well. Um, I've recently moved to Leeds University where I'm working in music psychology and um, the project I'm working on now is to do with uh, music listening behaviour for people who are reliant on hearing aids. So I'll mention a little more about that later. Um, and the final kind of image is just to show the, the broader aspects. Um, as I've just been mentioned, I'm also quite active in the Yorkshire Sound Women Network and our sister group in Sheffield, Sona, which is trying to support women and girls in the field. So a little plug there for those of you to whom that's more relevant. Um, come and join us. Um, so the talk today, uh, I'll try to stick more or less to our original plan. Um, and that's really to talk about the types of experiments that we might need to do in order to improve our technology to interact with us in sound. So it's quite a broad topic and I won't go into too much technical detail. Um, but what we're really talking about is the kind of the theories that underline how we can design better audio products. Um, and what we're really trying to do often is to have <laughs> some kind of an idea of how we're understanding auditory scenes, um, which really relies on trying to get reliable reports of how people experience sound. And we'll have a look at uh, some of the issues involved in reporting experiences of sound. When we do try to describe listening, we're actually talking about a variety of different tasks and a variety of different contexts. And in order to kind of um, build better tools and products and so on, it's often useful to go back to basics and think about what we're expecting intuitively from our own human experience of these sounds and 
tasks and contexts. So we'll talk a bit about that. And that leads into a kind of discussion of how we might make these listeners more robust. Um, and what we mean when we talk about machine listening, and I, I like to call machine mediated listening as well. Um, and hopefully there'll still be some time for questions and discussion at the end. So probably the most obvious kind of audio product is actually speech recognition when we think about interacting with technology through sound. Um, so this is, this is on the audio processing side, let's say, rather than the audio production. Um, and this is a screenshot from Siri. Uh, apparently a faster way to get things done, um, easier and faster. And the kind of basics underlying it is given away where it says the more you use Siri, the better it knows what you need at any moment. And that's kind of giving away the big data approach which underlies a lot of these topics. So collect more and more and more and more information about you that allows them to model your voice better and to predict what kind of uh, commands you might be giving. Um, beyond kind of recognizing the vocabulary of speech, there are lots of different things which a machine listener might be interested in hearing. Um, and one of the first things that's kind of coming to the fore at the moment are the paralinguistic aspects of the signal. So we're talking here about recognizing the emotion in voices, um, and that's a kind of conversational analysis technique which can be done in a computational fashion. Other things we might want to do are to kind of talk about what has happened in the sound, to detect events that are going on, maybe to interact with it, but at least to give kind of notification of alarms and so on. And one of the other things we might want to do is engage with the sound somehow. So you know, we might want to sort or search it to retrieve particular parts of sound. And I'm going to just give a little kind of example from the commercial world of each of these. So um, not only do we get kind of uh, plenty of call center phone calls, probably ourselves now, but it's quite interesting what's going on behind here. It's not just speech recognition when you're talking to a computer and it's trying to analyze what you're saying, but often even when you're interacting with a human on the end, your voice is being recorded and analytics can be run on your interaction with the person that you're talking to. So um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, whether it's Cogito or Cogito, but this company is um, providing a service which allows call centers to kind of monitor the interactions between their customers and their agents on the phone. Um, and it yeah, claims to provide live behavioral guidance to improve the quality of these interactions. And I just kind of picked up one little comment from the website which um, brought up an alert saying, empathy opportunity, try responding with compassion. <laughs> and um, so there we are, that kind of thing is on the market. Um, in terms of audio detection, there are a number of companies now providing services, mostly for security. Um, and this is Audio Analytic, which is based, uh, well, they have some offices down in Cambridgeshire. Um, and they're really looking out for specific classes of sound that they can um, kind of latch onto the fact that something has happened where it shouldn't have. So maybe um, listening out for breaking glass in a factory or gunshots or even, you know, oh, your baby's crying, you need to go and look after it. These kind of things are all in their database. Um, kind of typical uh, engagement strategies, you know, Shazam is obviously incredibly popular for people recognizing what sounds are being played in their environment. But um, this kind of idea of listening to the signal to detect what's going on um, and really to give you some kind of guided assistance to your musical output is starting to make its way into kind of um, digital audio workstations as well now. And um, the Isotope, for instance, has a track assistant which listens to uh, a bit of audio that you select and it tries to assess which instruments might be in the mix in order to give you a kind of faster helper start to get on and work with your audio in a more intelligent fashion. Um, the kind of last aspect which I wanted to mention to do with the technology, this is more to do with the hardware but also the software. Um, and it's to do with when we have hearing impairments that we have to cater for as well. So. Um, 
yeah, I kind of call this human mediated listening, uh, sorry, human listening, but machine mediated. I'm still struggling a bit with the language of how to describe this because obviously there's a human at the end of the chain who is receiving sound, but that sound has to pass through the device, which in this case is a hearing aid, um, before it reaches their brain. So the kind of standard line of miniaturization is going on in hearing aids as with many technologies. So we can get behind the ear hearing aids or in the ear hearing aids or in the canal hearing aids or completely in the canal hearing aids. Um, but they all perform largely the same job, which is to amplify the acoustic signal um, according to the particular hearing loss profile that you have. Cochlear implants are kind of a stage deeper. So if the function of your ear is not sufficient to transmit that acoustical signal at all, but your auditory nerve is still intact, then instead you can kind of bypass the whole acoustic signal and deliver an electric stimulation right into the brain instead. And in that sense, you have electrical hearing, but it's still generating a percept that arises from the sound in some sense. But really, the sounds that you do get through a device such as a cochlear implant are very um, impoverished in terms of the information that they hold. So there's very low spectral resolution in particular. Temporal resolution is quite tight, but uh, there are only 22 electrodes typically in the most successful of operations. So uh, it's hard to distinguish talkers, you know, who, what kind of pitch is being um, transmitted. And in particular, any cues which rely on, on pitch contours tend not to be transmitted. So it's hard to tell the social function of the words that are spoken. Um, and if you think about only having perhaps one of these devices, then essentially it, it's, uh, what, what your brain is having to do is to parse a single channel stream, so just one channel, and without any cues, therefore, from the location it's come from or from the pitch. And I've got a little kind of demo of what this might sound like. So my guess is that you probably picked up some of the words, but maybe not the context of who was saying what. So I'll give you the real one before, yeah, before you wonder about it too much. Anyways, it, wherever he goes, wherever he goes, if he's just going to bundle my bears, he takes his back with him. Oh my it's God. It's the bright red bag. So um, if we think about kind of what's happening in an audio scene, what we're really kind of experiencing is quite difficult to explain when we can move our attention around at will and focus on different sounds or um, I guess also bypass certain sounds as well. So we've got this kind of um, sound mixture which essentially we can decompose into different sets of elements or we can group them together and say these things all belong together. But it's quite hard to kind of explain really in detail what we are perceiving of a, of a particular soundscape. And I think as well as kind of having this way to filter out what's not present, we also infer things even when they're not present. So uh, if you kind of look at the image on the left, for instance, we can see apparently this triangle with the point at the top and the flat on the bottom, even though it's not there. And the same kind of thing is going on in our auditory system. So it's quite hard to ask a machine to listen out for something that's not there in that sense. So we've got to kind of develop ways to deal with these things, knowing what we look out for ourselves in sound as humans. And when we try and represent sound, we've got these different things going on then. We've got this kind of expectation, top-down approach of what we expect to hear in a sound um, and what our attention is drawn to. These kind of prior knowledge, semantics about it, pragmatics, whereas from the bottom-up side, we've got these kind of very sensory experiences which we can um, group maybe by common on and offset, harmonicity of the signal or continuity and proximity. Um, and I've got a little example here. I might not play it all, but play a little.
apologies, I put that to the beginning rather than select the next slide. So when we talk about listening, we're really talking about a lot of different things going on. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's quite hard to measure our perceptual experience. Um, the next section we'll talk about some of the kind of approaches and issues about trying to measure it, about getting reliable reports, bearing in mind that there are these kind of individual factors that we have, as well as the contextual factors that occur from um, the testing experience that we're in. So this is kind of just uh, schematically showing that we have these kind of bottom-up um, impressions of sound. So when, we, when the sound goes into our ear, there's something that we detect, and this we could call a low-level perception. And then from that, if we engage our kind of higher functions of evaluation and preference and so on, then we can start to talk about a higher-level percept in this case. Um, on the other hand, we have the, these factors of expectancy and attention, and they can influence both of the levels. You know, they can have an influence on our preference of something. They can also have an influence on how likely we are to detect something as well. So, for instance, we could, um, by using a prime tone, we might boost the sensitivity of our detection skills, um, or a distractor might take our attention away from it. Um, so, when we talk about measuring our perception, we have to decide really whether we're trying to cancel out these top-down factors or whether we're kind of taking account of them and working with them. And um, I've got some uh, experimental measures which uh, I'll introduce you to, which they don't necessarily remove them. I don't think it's really... Well, we'll talk about whether or not it's really ever possible to remove them. But th the point is that we kind of are aware of these factors and try to control for the fact that they're present. So we can kind of crudely classify measures into direct or indirect. So if you think about um, measuring something directly means you really are taking account of that thing, whereas measuring it indirectly is measuring something from which you infer something else. So in the direct sense, we might direct our awareness to a particular listening task um, and ask questions about it. That's a very common one we'll talk in more detail. Whereas on the indirect side, we might take um, physiological measures or we might look at reaction times to a signal and use that to infer some other percept from it. So using questions, as I mentioned, we usually direct our attention to a particular task. Um, because we're thinking about that task, we are quite conscious of these kind of top-down factors. You know, we've heightened our um, attention to it. Um, and in that sense, there's a large influence of these top-down factors. But these questions are very common ways to assess audio. It's usually what we do. Um, and they can be pointed at addressing either high-level or low-level perceptions. So on the high-level sense, you might say, do you prefer a particular thing? And on the low level, you might say, can you detect a particular thing? We'll look at each of these. So on a high level, the example might be something like, do you prefer spectral distortion A or B? And I think, um, yeah, if we're used to doing kind of preference tests when you're comparing two examples, it's quite a common thing that audio work involves, let's say. So this sort of thing is happening a lot in our, in our um, maybe not daily experience, but you know, if you go down to the shop and you're trying out two hi-fis, do I like this one or do I like that one? It's, it's the sort of question you're intuitively asking yourself. So in this case, um, it's a direct measure, and we can say it's direct in that we are putting our attention on the, on the measured perception, but it's also direct in the case that we're um, putting our attention on a specific attribute. So in this case, spectral distortion. So I mean, that's a, a terminology issue, which probably somebody would need to know a bit about what spectral meant and what distortion meant in order to do it. Um, but in, in any case, it kind of um, gives you this kind of heightened sensitivity. It focuses you on the thing 
that you're listening out for. So we, we mentioned it's a high level question because preferring um, puts you in this kind of evaluative state of mind. Um, and in that sense, it can be influenced not only by your own kind of inbuilt biases, but also by experimental demand characteristics, which means you might think, ooh, the experimenter wants me to prefer that one over that one. And these are kind of factors which um, you can ki kind of conceal by doing supposedly blind tests and so on. But ultimately, it's very hard to remove these things, um, especially if you're working with experienced listeners who really know their stuff, because they'll probably recognize what techniques you're working with anyway. So it's, it's something to be aware of, let's say. Um, when we look on the low level perception, we're talking about the detection instead of a preference. But we still, you know, so we, we don't engage so much kind of evaluative mindset in this sense. Um, but there's still perhaps a possibility for this kind of bias of wanting to please the experimenter. And in that case, a kind of heightened sensitivity to the change in sound. So even if you're not really sure what's going on, you probably kind of ramp up the detection for changes, if nothing else. Um, and it's possible to have these questions either drawing awareness to the attribute that's being tested, the spectral distortion, or not. So in a yes-no sense, can you detect the attribute? Obviously, it's named. Um, and also, you can have a kind of two alternative for alternative first choice, the two AFC. So you could ask which sample contains this particular attribute. But you can set up these experiments as well for well, listeners who may not know the terminology for what you're talking about um, by asking in this ABX paradigm which sample, A or B, is the same as the third. So these are all kind of detection tasks that we, we call lower level. So if we look instead of the direct ones, if we look towards the indirect side, um, I haven't talked here about reaction times, but I've got um, something about the physiological data instead. So in all these cases, we're measuring something, but we're inferring something from that measurement. So it's an, uh, an attempt to kind of measure perception without actually getting somebody to concentrate on what's being measured. So in this case, we might look at the galvanic skin response, which is how much you're sweating, essentially. Um, the pupil dilation or heart rate or the EEG signal are all kind of different aspects from which people have attempted to measure preference or enjoyment or likability and so on of sound. And again, these can kind of, to a certain extent, you can look at high level and low level attributes, but we're just gonna talk about high level perception, sorry, here. Um, so when we're, when we're looking at the high level uh, perception, we might talk about enjoyment or preference, but we're no longer asking people directly about that preference or enjoyment. So they're not in the kind of evaluative mindset, so they won't be questioning themselves about, ooh, what does preference really mean? Do I prefer that one or do I prefer that one? And they're not going through this process of over-evaluation. So in that sense, we've kind of um, lessened the influence of the top-down factors, expectation and attention. But we have to infer the thing that we're looking for. And there, there are kind of works that have argued for this aspect, but um, they're not my speciality, so I won't talk in detail about those ones, let's say. But one way that this is... Um, also indirect is to talk about, well rather it doesn't specifically talk about the attribute of the signal that's being measured. So that leads itself to allowing quite nice measurements on the fly. So for instance, if you're um, working in virtual reality or something, you can kind of look at the arousal states of, of your body or of your listener's body and, and really kind of make little changes in the audio. Just They're just listening to them. They're not necessarily aware of what it is that they're listening to. Um, and that's another, another method that can be done. So, as I said, both, uh, I think both Cleo and I in our work have tended to use these direct measures. 
And th there is an argument against it in that it's perhaps an unnatural thing that you're measuring. You know, you're, you're forcing people to pay attention and do a task. But on the other hand, as long as you can account for these factors of expectation and attention, then you can, you can at least more confidently say that you're having a result based on a conscious perception. And it's not that they're um, affected by some other experience that's going on necessarily. However, <laughs> we've said that this listening is like an umbrella term for many activities that we do. Um, and when we try to put that behavior into a machine listener, we have to kind of account in this way for these different activities that we do. And it's uh, really not a straightforward task, let's say, because whereas we might intuitively guide our attention to aspects of sound that we're most interested in at any particular moment, it's hard to give that flexibility so far to a machine listener. So, you know, we might choose to, con to um, yeah, focus on the pitch or to focus on the dynamics or the manner in which a particular sound is performed. But to ask a machine listener to represent that sound for us or uh, to simplify it if we need to have it delivered through a hearing aid or to capture it if we want to tag it in a broadcast domain or to assess it if we need to provide a metric to our call center manager. You know, whatever the task is in hand, we have to kind of deal with this system in a different way. Um, kind of from a bottom-up perspective, audio is essentially captured just uh, as this kind of one-dimensional value which varies through time. So whether it's a you know, magnetic tape or if it's a set of um, numbers in your sound file, it's essentially representing you know, the vibration of air that is captured at a microphone. And um, this kind of one-dimensional representation is probably like the simplest thing that we've dealt with um, in a sense. But it's, it's robust in that sense, but it kind of, its representation doesn't tell us enough about the event. And we can say that it fails in that regard because we can't separate two sounds when they occur at the same time. So we saw this before um, when we had the mixture of the snore sound and the airplane going over. We, we, our ears could kind of clearly hear two different things going on, but um, I'm not sure if you noticed. But the um, temporal domain had uh, the snores kind of occurring regularly with the sound of the aircraft smoothing over them. So they're not kind of separable in that sense. So we need to introduce another dimension to the sound to understand a bit more about it. And if we add a, another dimension, what we typically talk about is a spectral feature. So we separate time on one axis and frequency on another. And in this case, we can see the kind of the content of the sound more clearly. So here we could have a harmonic sound at the beginning. You can see the different partials which constitute its singingness, let's say. Um, and from that, we can extract, we can estimate a fundamental frequency um, and describe the pitch that somebody is talking at. Um, and that kind of thing often is used, but often fails as well, because if you put several notes together, their, their structures overlap th up through the spectrum, and it's hard to separate back to the kind of initial um, sounds that were comprising that mixture. But nonetheless, it often these systems kind of fail in interesting ways, and um, they're often used, even though they're quite frail, and used to good effect. And then we kind of get into wondering what, what, our, what our own listening systems are doing with sound. Um, and the kind of, we start to run out of the vocabulary in English to describe what's going on pretty soon. So if we take sounds which are the same in terms of loudness and pitch and duration, maybe even the same in terms of the direction from which they come, then we start to fail to be able to talk about quite how they are different from one another. And this is the kind of topic of study in timbral research. Um, and there are a couple of um, terms which in English are usually taken to stand for specific properties of sound. So the brightness, for instance, more or less corresponds with the perception, sorry, the perception that corresponds with the sen spectral centroid of the sound. 
Um, and similarly, the noisiness, although we use the term very loosely in everyday language, but there is a formula you can plug in to compute the spectral flatness of the, um, the spectral flatness being, if you have a white noise, it has a flat spectrum, and if you have a single um, sign tone, it's very peaky. So somewhere between these, you have a value of very flat to very peaky, and that gives you a value of noisiness, which you can compute. And we seem to kind of correspond more or less something in our perception responds to that. Um, but these measures, although you can kind of compute them and do very sophisticated experiments to describe them, they all depend on our context in which we're listening. So if you perform the same set of experiments in different rooms, you end up with different perceptual spaces to a degree. Um, only we as people can adapt to those spaces. And so the numerical values that we derive no longer match the kind of experiences that we undergo. So um, that's the kind of the crux at which Cleo and I started doing our work in this field. So we know that something happens so that humans can adapt to the room that they're listening in, but actually machine listeners don't exactly do that at the moment. And as I mentioned, this kind of came for me was like full circle because of the problems that I'd had in my practical work when I was making sound installations. And it's this, this idea of you put out sound, something happens because of the room that you're in, you take it in again, as maybe through your ears or maybe through a microphone if you're a computer, and you have to be able to kind of deal with this feedback between what's going out into the room and what's coming in to your ears. And whereas our ears are just naturally doing this magic inside our head, we have to kind of tell the computer what it is that we want it to be doing to understand that this really is the same sound but in a different environment. So if we think about what the room is doing, I've got the kind of top left side of this uh, picture shows a schematic of this. So um, we've got a kind of the first sound to go, say, from me to you is the direct sound. Then we have a couple of strong early reflections, probably from the first surfaces, maybe the walls or the floors. Um, and then we'll have more diffuse reverberation, typically, which has bounced over more of the environment before coming to into your ears. Um, and we tend to think about the early reflections um, as being quite tightly packed with the direct sound and the late reverberation is coming after and being more diffuse. And one way to kind of characterize this is to think of these early reflections as a spectral effect, a coloration on the signal. Um, and this is where Cleo's PhD was spent. Uh, looking at the adaptation to these spectral colorations, spectral distortions on the signal. Um, and one way you can see that uh, is looking at vowels. Others are in music and um, different types of signal that you can process to examine these effects. If you look instead the kind of the longer term effects of these, um, the late reverberation in particular kind of dominates the signal and it has the effect of um, increasing the noise floor and reducing the dynamic range of the signal, much like a kind of additive background noise signal would. And these kind of noise-like effects are uh, where I spent my PhD. So it's looking at a similar effect, but in a temporal domain, really, rather than a spectral domain. And um, the kind of method that I picked to examine these in the PhD was looking at stop consonants. But both Cleo and I came originally from a couple of papers by the same author who was really interested in how we do adapt to the environment. So compensation for spectral distortion, um, we could say that the spectrum is really the key to say recognize the vowel, to recognize the identity of a vowel. Um, and that the environment you're in, so that might be the room, or the loudspeakers, microphone, is kind of basically a transmission channel which affects your recognition of the identity of that vowel. So with certain types of spectral distortion, 
the actual sound can be altered sufficiently that if you hear it on its own, you no longer recognise it in one form, you recognise it in the other form. So an e might be understood as an a, or an a as an e, and vice versa. Um, however, if you have time, if you put that in a context which allows you to adapt up to that point, then even though the physical signal is in an altered form, you're still able to understand it as it was originally intended to be. The same goes on for stop consonants. So um, in this case, the idea is that the t in stir is actually a tiny little gap. There's a burst of high frequency energy, but then there's a small silence which can be filled in by the reverberant energy um, such that you may not actually um, perceive that gap in a reverberant circumstance. Um, and Tony Watkins' work, which has inspired both of these kind of approaches, um, I've got a few of his samples which I'll try to play you. Um, I'd like to say, ideally these should be delivered on headphones, but I don't have headphones for you all, I'm sorry. So they have um, a signal recorded in a dry acoustic, which has then been convolved with a particular impulse response of the room. Um, and they're designed to be heard over headphones. So I'm not sure if you'll get the effect or not, but even if you don't get the effect, you should get to understand the paradigm of the experiment. So I'll play them for that regard. So what we'll hear in each case is the word sir or stir. Um, and it's embedded in this test sentence. Okay, next you'll get to click on. And this word is kind of inserted. Um, there's a continuum of stimuli, so that at one, at one end it's definitely the word sir, and at the other end it's definitely the word stir, only that T is actually faked. <laughs> and because it's artificially imposed, you can alter the degree to which the T is imposed and make quite a flexible paradigm to measure where our percept switches between sir and stir. So what we've got here are three examples which have, um, they're drawn from a particular point in the continuum where, for me, the effect holds over headphones. Um, and we have, first of all, a dry signal, uh, relatively close, as if having a conversation nearby. Then we'll hear um, a nearby conversation with a test word from further away. And then we'll hear the whole thing from further away and we'll see how it goes. Okay, next you'll get stir to click on. Okay, next you'll get stir to click on. Okay, next you'll get stir to click on. Okay, so as I said, these really have to be heard on headphones. So if you're interested to find out more about it, I'd love to do the demo over headphones later. But the issue there is really that your perception of what's going on is altered not only by the test word itself, but also by hearing it in the context from before. And through this kind of um, modeling this paradigm led me to ask different questions about the type of effect which is going on in our auditory systems um, and to kind of propose uh, alterations to this. But using, in fact, in my case, I, I set up similar experiments with real speech rather than this kind of sensitive paradigm. I found out that this particular effect is very robust and seems to happen within about half a second or so, half a second to a second. Um, and you can, that's all you need to accommodate for these changes that the, re that the reverb introduces on the test word. Um, but if you kind of think about a typical machine listener at the moment, uh, it was needing a uh, couple of years since I kind of did the equivalent experiment, but at that stage it was around about 10 hours of training data that you would need in a particular condition to accommodate for the, the benefit that we can get from half a second of audio. So there's kind of clearly something different going on between these big kind of data hungry modeling proposals and our own kind of flexibly readjusting mindset. Um, the thing is, it's not easy to know what's going on. And this is a kind of simplified version of what, uh, what the auditory system might be like. So on the left, we've got the peripheral system, um, the sound going into the pinna, through the ear canal, 
through the three little bones into the cochlea and up the auditory nerve to the brain, whereby it becomes this kind of electrical mass and it goes through various different stages of auditory processing, some of which are linked in with other senses as well, so your vision might have an effect and so on. Um, but what's kind of not often spoken of or not so often spoken of are the descending pathways which come back down from the higher auditory centres to the inner ear. Um, and you can see these as descending arrows from auditory cortex and so on, right back down to the inner ear. And what's thought is that these descending pathways are what allows us to recalibrate our listening to the environment that we're in. And it's not, it's not been kind of conclusively proved that this is active for listening in room reverberation, but there is quite a lot of physiological data that shows this is active um, in various little animals for listening to noise. And because we saw earlier the long-term effects of reverb are somewhat similar to noise, that was the kind of underlying premise that um, took my machine listening proposal into the PhD. Um, and what I ended up doing was adding this kind of so-called efferent, like the top-down pathway back into a model of auditory processing. Um, developed, yeah, th so this was proposed by Ferry and Medis um, to account for hearing impairment in the auditory system. But I won't go into the details of it there, but it's just to kind of say that this is a computational model of the effects which we saw earlier. Um, and as such, it's quite detailed. It has a signal going in at the bottom to the outer middle ear, OME, representation of the basilar membrane and the hair cells, um, which allow you to have this kind of spectral temporal excitation pattern, a bit like a spectrogram really. But this is um, in the computational model, then allowed to be readjusted. So the way in which that process works is varied depending on the reverberation condition that it's been in. And this kind of measure um, is done across a little time window and alters, essentially allows the presence of a lot of reverberation to turn down the amplification in the inner ear as we think that the hair cells, so um, the basilar membrane has uh, hair cells which effectively pass the signal up to the brain, but on the other side act as dampers to protect your system, essentially. Um, the most recent kind of simplification of this model is very simplified and existed uh, last year in an art installation as a kind of prototype to try and put my two worlds back together. Um, so hanging a microphone in the space there and allowing that microphone to adapt to the room in a kind of similar way that we think the auditory system might, as in measuring, uh, in this case, the loudness of the signal and adapting so that it will um, take a kind of short-term measure as these fast efferent effects do and over the space of a couple of minutes as well, just get itself into a sensitive area. Um, and I was pleased that it worked quite well. <laughs> But a more kind of typical outcome for this kind of research is actually in healthcare, let's say. So um, we talked a bit about these speech tasks. And um, I think it's true to say that in most of, uh, most of the experimental world, speech is a very nice signal to work with because it's quite easy to ask people in words about words that they've heard. So um, we kind of talk about this primacy of speech and certainly in terms of the technology that supports listening, a lot of the technology has been designed to support our perception of speech. Um, yeah, so I'd like if, if we, yeah, I think, I hope we've time just to show you three very short examples um, from work which is trying to stretch beyond the kind of speech recognition side into something a bit further. So um, rather than understanding the vocabulary, we're going to look at a little bit about the prosody in speech and other aspects beyond that. We can think about music and about environmental sound more generally. And the thing really is uh, to notice on this figure on the right, uh, I can't find the mouse again. Oh yeah. So audiologists will talk about the speech banana 
And what they mean is that speech is kind of in this banana-shaped region of the signal. And the trouble comes when you have a device which is set to optimise perception of these things. If you then try to force this so-called watermelon of music through the speech <laughs> banana, then the device can't represent it very well. And worse than that still, the, the kind of representation of all sounds that we can hear when you have to listen to it through a hearing aid or a cochlear implant is quite dissatisfying to most. So um, just a slide each about three projects I've worked on then. Uh, this was one um, where uh, the idea is to support the conversational rehabilitation of cochlear implant users. And if you have a cochlear implant fitted, at the moment you're just given one-to-one -one kind of rehabilitation on the NHS. So you'll be supported to practice listening to speech and practice speaking back, but you'll be asked to find a quiet environment to do this in and to um, make sure that you have a willing conversation partner who is going to wait for you to finish and then will take their turn. And these kind of pauses between turns are, are encouraged actively in order to give you the best chance of understanding the speech that you come across. But the thing is that people with cochlear implants have very good speech perception now and they want to get out and join in more, um, just more typical situations. So socially, there's very little conversation that we do in that manner of one person, then another, then another. Um, and a lot of the time people are talking, overlapping each other fast, energetic, you know, the, I suppose the, the example I played earlier about the, um, the red bag and the bungalow and bears, that's just a random exchange from uh, a, a data set which was recorded of friends talking in a relaxed manner. But it turns out that almost 45% of the conversational turns that we have overlap. So it's not you know, something that's rare. It's something that's happening a lot of the time when we're just chatting with friends. Um, so it's very difficult if you're relying on lip reading and two people are moving their lips at once, it's very difficult to know who the important person is to listen to. So the next difficulty is, of course, that the cochlear implant doesn't encode the cues which we normally depend on for this turn taking. So uh, if, our, if, our, um, if our amplitude goes up and our pitch goes up, we give the impression that we want to keep talking, whereas if we tail off, it's a bit more obvious we're ready to stop. And um, the idea here then is on, on the human side to promote this training in understanding the social intention. Um, and that's done through this kind of comp computational conversational analysis method. Um, similar to the call handling before, but in a healthcare application, let's say. Um, so the project I'm working on at the moment in Leeds is about listening to music with hearing aids. And it's the first kind of systematic wide scale study to try and understand people's experiences in this regard. Um, and just from our kind of initial data, we've got a thousand or so responses in now. Um, and around 10% of people have actually provided their audiogram to support their results uh, in this questionnaire. But what we can see is that there's actually quite a poor agreement between their reported experience and their kind of audiological category of hearing loss. Um, so that kind of mismatch in a way between the specific testing methods that we have and, and actually how it affects you in daily life. That's kind of something which is still being understood. The problem when it comes to hearing aids particularly, uh, you know, I mentioned this speech banana and the music watermelon, but the real difficulty is in telling the hearing aid what, what are the musical sounds that you're trying to listen to. And some of the kind of report that came back through our conference was that um, you might try to listen to a flute or a kind of relatively pure organ pipe and the feedback cancellation loops of the hearing aid kick in because it thinks it's a constant steady pitch which should not be occurring because the device has been optimised for the rhythm of speech and these kind of contours and the alternation of pitch and consonant sounds and so on. So um, there's a lot of work that's kind of going on there but I wanted to kind of share um, 
I think a bit, especially in the audio interest audio industry, one of the things that we can really do to support other people's communication is to kind of think about it in advance. Um, and providing a loop, um, sign language interpretation if needed be, um, lip reading cameras and this kind of live captioning where we, some of the kind of methods that we tried to do this in the conference. And um, I think it was all kind of very much appreciated by those that were there. And it's not kind of something that we do as standard, but I think in the future it should be because we're kind of wanting to support this easier access. And um, these are some of the fields where actually we can start to work, you know, doing live captioning is essentially speech recognition, um, you know, as you would have on your TV and so on. So these are other kind of applications for our skills. Um, yeah, so beyond the music bubble, we're into environmental sound and um, one of the projects I worked on was about uh, recording snore sounds at home using smartphone beside the bed. And the idea is that um, if we could have a kind of reliable test that just runs on your mobile phone at home, you might be able to avoid some of the delay and discomfort of undergoing the kind of sleep assessment that you would get in a hospital. Um, might be a bit of an early warning for sleep apnea and some of the kind of serious conditions that you want to take care of. Um, but again, there's kind of much to be learned in a, in a task like this because um, we found actually that humans are not often in agreement about what a snore is. Um, and there's no such thing as an acoustic definition of a snore yet. So these are kind of uh, tasks which in the end I think we had about four different experiments trying to um, use these direct and indirect methods to assess whether or not people might be in agreement um, or disagreement about the snow and of course if you can't get a, a, a data set where humans agree then it's quite challenging to make a machine agree in a way that satisfies another group of humans so it's uh, yeah, plenty to learn in all these tasks. So um, I've tried to kind of show a bit of Cleo and I's work on getting reliable reports about human perception. Um, and we've talked a bit about the different contexts these are in, different tasks using direct and indirect measures. And really then I've just kind of given a bit of an introduction to these different issues that you come across when you're trying to build machine listeners or machine mediated listening devices. And again, it's a lot to do with context and task and the different applications that we've seen. Um, so I feel like I've only just kind of touched the tip of the iceberg. There's lots more to say, but I've been speaking quite a long time and I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So um, if you're interested in further kind of references and reading on this, please get in touch. And I've put both Cleo and my contact details there. So I hope we have time for questions now. And if they're more appropriate, I'll point you in this direction. Thank you. Thank you.